Well, welcome all. My name is Kevin Vanden Mellenberg. I think everybody here knows that. Uh, director of the lab here in Boise. Um, this is the kickoff to the fall series uh, at the, the Integrated Design Lab Fall Professional Series uh, on behalf of both University, University of Idaho and Montana State University. I'd like to welcome you and also like to say uh, pay thanks to Better Bricks, Idaho Power, and Northwestern Energy for helping bring our speaker over tonight. I'm going to go very quickly through a list of events that are upcoming just to make you all aware and then I won't do it at every of the other talks, at least not in this full detail. Um, the uh, fall series flyer, I was having a hard time getting it, printing, getting, getting it to print to give you folks copies, so you have the digital version. Um, on October 9th will be our next presentation uh, from Heather Burpee at the University of Washington talking about high performance hospitals and some field study work that they did and looking at European hospitals and some of their models uh, for energy efficiency, looking at how they're ratcheting down their um, uh, energy use index per, you know, energy use per square foot and some of the code issues that allow them to maybe push a little further than we do here and some of the hang-ups that, that we're running into in the United States and uh, looking toward trying to help change some of those things. On October 13th, we've got Chuck Eastman uh, from Georgia Tech University, I guess it's university, Georgia Tech, um, coming to talk on building information modeling as it relates to building performance and simulation. Uh, that should be really interesting. He's the guy who wrote the book on BIM, essentially, so uh, it'll be a pretty cool uh, topic, I'm sure. He's currently active in a lot of research tracks related to building information modeling and writing some software programs and things like that. Um, on October 30th, your very own Brad Aker and myself will talk about some of the recent research projects we're involved in and commissioning issues and, as the title says, how to, the tough challenges of making stuff work um, and keeping it working, maybe like we'll hear tonight. Um, and then finally on November 6th, we've got Dave Hewitt with the New Buildings Institute coming on and talking about what's beyond getting to 50. So we've heard about getting to 50 from Mark Frankel in a previous lecture series uh, that is 50% uh, energy use or 50% below code. Uh, so what's, what's beyond that? What has NBI been up to since then, I think, is really what that'll be about. Uh, two other items to be aware of. Uh, October 22nd, 23rd, and 24th is the Idaho Energy and Green Build Conference. Ken Baker can tell you all more, a lot more about that. Uh, log on to idahocities.org to sign up for that event. Um, the, the night of the 22nd, October 22nd, will be the Better Bricks Awards as part of the conference. Ed Mazaria, the founder of the 2030 Architecture 2030 Challenge, will be as the keynote. He'll also be keynoting the next morning of the 23rd at the conference. And then finally, much closer to now, uh, next week we've got Ken Baker and Eric Makala uh, talking about the Advanced Building Core Performance Program, more of a prescriptive process to 30% beyond code. Uh, and to register for that, you're going to go to newbuildingsinstitute.org, I believe. Um, all the technicalities out of the way. Uh, I want to thank Jim Volkman for coming and presenting this evening with us. Jim's a mechanical engineer, has been working in the area of energy efficiency for about 20 years in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, the last seven or so years has been focusing on building operations and maintenance. And uh, as a member of, or is it principal of? Principal works, uh, member is fine, whatever. Strategic Energy Group, is that right? That's right. Uh, out of Portland, uh, been working on energy management policy and energy management plans at a corporate level and the process that corporations need to go through to make sure that they get implemented and, and uh, get in, in place. So I'm sure there are lots of other great things you're going to tell us about, Jim. But with that, I'll turn the floor over. And thank you all for coming. All right. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, and thanks, everybody, for coming. I'm assuming that the mic is live at this point. Um, one of the things I wanted to, to kind of get a handle on before I get too far into this is, is kind of what the audience makeup is. Uh, I, I know it could be pretty diverse, and I, I just was curious if we had any architects here in the audience, okay? Uh, we have a couple. How about uh, property managers or facility managers? Any, anybody along those lines? Okay. Uh, building engineers, building operators, anybody? How about just engineers? Uh, mechanical design, that type of activity? Okay. Uh, well, that's, that's basically the background I come from, and I believe both of you guys are from Idaho Power and the Energy Conservation, and you are as well? Okay, good. Um, 
what I'm really going to sit here and talk about is, is, is better building performance and a process. Um, talk about some of the resources that, that you're going to need to have to achieve that. Uh, talk a little bit about some of the value that you can get, some of the common opportunities that can be found in buildings. Uh, but my real focus here, as much as anything, and, and part of this is, is it's the BOMA Energy Efficiency Series, so it, it, it's a little bit skewed towards uh, uh, building operators and building managers, is uh, the difference between operations and maintenance. And I think it's a really critical thing to think about here is we always think of O&M. You know, we always put out O&M, O&M, and we kind of join the two together. And I think it's really important today to think about operating a building and maintaining a building and understanding that there is a significant difference. So that's one of the, the, the three key items that I'm going to try and get out of this particular uh, discussion today. Uh, I hope to be able to provide you uh, some insight into the value that you can get from uh, what we're calling an enhanced or best practices O&M effort. And then lastly, uh, what are the basic elements of that enhanced uh, O&M effort? And one of the things I like to start with is, is kind of just an exercise. You don't have to talk to your neighbor. You're certainly welcome to. I'll give you a couple minutes to think about it. But you know, think about how you look or, or how you operate and maintain your car. You know, what are the things you do to operate your car? And think about it in terms of energy efficiency. And what are the things that you do to maintain your car in terms of efficiency? And you know, if you think about that, uh, you can go out and, and, and look. Uh, I'm going to let you actually talk about it. But Think about that as two separate items. And I, you know, we'll give you a couple, maybe a minute, minute and a half. There's only a few people here. Um, but you know, talk amongst yourselves a little bit. And let's see if, if we can come up with some ideas. I'll ask you guys a couple of questions. I've got a couple specific actions here at the end, and particularly as we get into this market uh, of high energy costs for gasoline. This might be kind of fun. So I thought we'd try it. We'll see what happens. Uh, does anybody want to? lay out some numbers, any, any ideas? What, how would you, what would you do from an operations perspective to uh, uh, operate your car more energy efficiently? Just operating it. Don't gun it all the I'm sorry? Don't gun it. Don't gun it, that's absolutely. What, what would you do from a maintenance perspective? How would you maintain a build, uh, not a building, but a, your car from an energy efficiency perspective? What types of things? You're abs absolutely right. And so the two items actually that I have here are check the tire pressure monthly, and maintain the correct pressure and making sure you actually check it when it's at the proper temperature. You know, you don't want to check it when it's hot. The other one is how many people here turn your car off if you're going to park for more than a minute, minute and a half? Okay, that's one that you can do. Uh, and that is, and so those are two different ones. One's a maintenance activity and one's an operator. So, uh, better building operations. Uh, you know, we talk about the end, it improves occupant comfort, all those things. Well, let's kind of define what is better building operations. And the definition of better building operations from our perspective uh, isn't necessarily efficient, uh, isn't necessarily a great comfort. Uh, it's a combination of three real things. And it is uh, occupant comfort. Is the building meeting the indoor environmental needs of the occupants or uh, 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 space or stuff? that's actually put in the space. So if you're storing ice cream, are you able to meet those needs, okay? So that's the number one criteria. Whether you're in a, a, an office environment, whether you're in a hospital environment, whether you're in a, a grocery store, you have to be able to meet those occupant needs. The number two issue is reliability. You've gotta be able to have your systems available whenever uh, it, it's necessary. So equipment reliability becomes the next one. And then the third one is how do you efficiently deliver those to um, uh, efficiently deliver to those two actions. So if you're thinking about in terms of efficiency, you've got energy and you have your gas costs, your electric costs, but you also have operating costs of labor. You have maintenance dollars, you have material dollars and, and parts that you're putting into your, your uh, building. So there's all these different pieces that can come into that. And, and it's important to think about from a metrics perspective that you look at those three things and number one being occupant comfort uh, for most commercial real estate office buildings. This is kind of how we've laid out the um, two kind of specific activities. We're, we're looking at what we call enhanced o &M, which is best practices. That's about persistence and sustainability. And then we're also looking at uh, tune-ups. How do you tune up your building? 
We also have equipment replacement in there, and, and equipment replacement becomes that periodic piece. It happens every once in a while, uh, and, and we need it as part of better building operations because, you know, 10 years you're going to have to replace uh, something, every 15 years maybe an, an air handler. Uh, but the building tune-up and the enhanced O&M are those specific activities that as building operators and owners that can be addressed uh, in terms of meeting uh, that better uh, building performance. So this, actually as much as anything, I like the, uh, the flow plates. Uh, those flow plates, which are right here, uh, measure actual airflow across them using a differential pressure. Uh, and they're used often in packaged rooftop equipment for measuring uh, uh, economizer operation. But back to the better building operations, there's, there's create a cycle of continuous improvement. How can you make this in a continuous improvement? And this gets back to that period, periodic nature of the tune-up and that ongoing activity of the building operations. Uh, one of the things I think that's going to be important, uh, particularly in the Boise market, is you know, some of these services are going to have to be implemented by outside service contractors uh, for a lot of different reasons. And I think one of the primary reasons is service contractors are actually delivering the operations uh, into these buildings, and so they're going to have to be a big part of the whole team as, as you move forward. So here's a building tune-up, uh, kind of the definition and how we call it. Uh, we've got a periodic event. It requires minimal capital investment. We're looking at low-cost, no-cost opportunities. And uh, we sometimes might uncover some capital projects. Okay? That's certainly not the focus of a building tune-up. Building tune-up is looked at, it, you know, it's, it's somewhat related to commissioning, and I'll, I'll get to kind of a comparison between retro commissioning and a building tune-up here in a little bit. But it's, it's really trying to focus in on how you can change the operations in a building, whether it be sequences, whether it be schedules, to improve that performance. It also wants to look at what are the operational activities that you need to do and, and take into account as you move forward to uh, support that persistence. And so, for example, if you're looking at scheduling, and it's an issue as you go through the building, you find that you know, the equipment's running too long, what are the act action items from an operations and, uh, perspective that we need to take to check that on an ongoing basis. How often does that need to occur? Is that an annual check? I mean, for example, programmable thermostats. Let's say you're going in and you find that they're getting changed every week, for example, um, on, the, on uh, how they've scheduled them on. Somebody gets in there and messes with them. Well, maybe it's something for a while. Somebody's going to have to go in and check and manage that on a, on a weekly basis until you can communicate and make people aware of the, the value of not doing that. This graph here is really just laying out some of the energy costs. I think as much as anything, it's, it's just illustrative. It's not a specific um, project. It just indicates, all right, if, if in year 2007 we implement a building tune-up, we reduce our energy costs and we do this continuous improvement activity, so we actually continue to reduce our energy costs over time, um, and then we start to go back up. If, if we don't do the tune-up again, we typically will see um, energy costs starting to go back up. And this red line, Along here is the, the line that says, you know, if we did nothing. And really, as much as anything, this is illustrative. I think we actually have some very specific examples of buildings and how they've reduced energy uh, a little further in. So the key steps to a building tune-up, obviously there's got to be interest in doing a building tune-up, and that's really the first step. Somebody's got to say, let's go in and do it. But the, the step from an from a engineering or a technical perspective is you've got to get in and diagnose the problems. And this is very similar to a commissioning process in terms of the diagnosis that has to take place, but it's not commissioning. It's focusing on those low-cost, no-cost opportunities. And, and I'll talk a little later about the four common opportunities, but we don't want uh, to think of a building tune-up as a, as a comprehensive examination of the sequences and the functionality of all the systems. This is just trying to go in and really cream skimming. Uh, when you think about in terms of a building tune-up. So when you go in, you're going to examine, you're going to identify some, some opportunities, sometimes you can perform some quick fixes, uh, and then you're going to have to formulate and, and develop and implement uh, the opportunities that, that come out of that whole activity. So we're looking at developing an, implementation, uh, an action plan for implementation, we're looking at verifying, how are you going to verify that those fixes were actually made, and how do you uh, verify that, that the benefits, whether they be uh, maintenance dollars, uh, energy dollars, or just occupant comfort are achieved. So, you know, in terms of the team, 
this is really a team effort. Um, I think there's a lot of benefits in creating a team effort in particular, particularly to persistence of uh, savings over the long term. If you can include the building operators in the activity, um, you're going to need to include occupants if we're looking at commercial real estate, uh, office real estate. Uh, they need to be aware of what's happening. Uh, there's a lot of times where you go into a building and you'll make a change, and it's a change for the better, but it's going to impact a lot of different people, and some people are actually going to be, become uncomfortable because of what you've done in the building. Um, and they need to be aware that that's, you're still willing to work with them and you're going to fix that, but first you have to make this, this little fix here to find out where the other problems are. And there's many, many times where occupants are, are capable and actually do derail some of these activities and, and the benefits can't be achieved because you haven't included them in, in the whole overall effort. Uh, service contractors, uh, in a lot of cases you're going to need engineering resources to be able to deliver this. Um, one of the things that Better Bricks actually is working on is trying to support the, the market uh, in developing people that can uh, deliver these types of service at the service contractor level and then uh, even more deliberately looking at from an engineering perspective how we can support development on the commissioning skills that can be applied into, into a building tune-up type of thing. Um, we want to look at, at the utilities. Idaho Power, for example, it, it, you know, is, it has some uh, incentives available for retrofits. Uh, I don't know what their, their efforts are around the uh, commissioning or building tune-up area, but I'm sure that they're more than happy to work with you, at least in providing information from a utility bill or uh, any um, projects uh, that would save electrical energy at some point. So there's a lot of different actions and, and activities. So when we think about the building diagnostic, um, you know, it's a typical thing. Everybody wants to look at what are the, the previous studies that have been done? You know, what do you do uh, as an operator on a day-to-day on a -day basis? What are the sequences of operations? Uh, and we're really looking at trying to diagnose some specific problems. If a, if a building operator says, you know, I got an occupant comfort problem in the northwest quadrant of my building, and I can't figure out what's going on. You know, those are the types of things where you start to do a little bit of root cause. What, what is the reason behind that? And, and try and resolve some of those issues. You're trying basically to knock down the bumps. The things that people find, I mentioned cream skimming, uh, we can also think of it as bumps. Uh, just don't make sure you take the hammer to it. But, uh, uh, and then lastly, as you move through, you need to formulate strategies. What, are, what, what is the strategy? Uh, is it a sequence change? Uh, do I need to m modify a discharge air temperatures, make a reset uh, as part of what I'm doing in the building? And how can I move that forward? And then they're going to move forward into, um, well, actually, you're going to do some quick fixes. And this actually is, I, I do like this example. And this is, this is a real uh, example. These are all uh, damper actuators. And you can see they're pretty much just laying on the uh, uh, ductwork. Uh, this is a multi-zone where they're uh, doing a lot of mixing. And basically, there is nothing happening in this particular <laughs> system. Uh, that's what I would call, you could go in and do maybe a quick fix. You obviously want to know why they've let it get to this stage. But you could certainly go in and, and start to make some modifications. If you go in and you find a system is in hand mode, you, know, you can certainly put it in auto mode most of the time. You've got to be really cautious, though, of course, about you know, if you put it in auto, there has to be a reason they put it in hand to begin with. But let's find out what that reason is. And if not, let's, let's fix it. Uh, I've been into several buildings. I can uh, think of one. They had 550,000 CFM of outside air. And for some reason, they had turned off their heat recovery pumps. They had a runaround loop on all those systems. They turned them off and had been sitting there for three or four months, and it was costing them, actually ended up costing them about $190,000 a year to have those heat recovery pumps off. Um, they couldn't tell me why they'd been turned off. I just, you know, they were off when I got here, so I just left them. You know, so there can be some significant uh, value, even in those quick fixes. All we did there is flip a switch. So formulating uh, the action plan, um, you know, as they go through, we're going to diagnose these opportunities. We're going to find all these issues in the building. We're going to come up with these strategies, and these need to be documented so that somebody's going to be able to prioritize those. What are, what, are the, what are the reasons I'm going to want to put this or implement this strategy or make this fix or, or uh, uh, overcome these problems that I have in the building? And so we've got to have some documentation as we go through what the benefits are, and then we need to put that in front of somebody that can make a decision that says, okay, this sounds like a good fix. Here's the value that I'm going to achieve out of this. And maybe it's an occupant comfort 
issue. Maybe there's a tenant retention problem in the building. Maybe it's uh, 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 energy cost savings that they're really concerned about. But there's always some priority, and somebody needs to make a, a definition of what that priority is. It's always good, particularly if you're on the service side, to figure out what those priorities are moving in so that you can start to focus in on what those priorities are rather than um, coming to them and saying, here's a list of things we think might be fun and might be good to implement. Uh, to actually step back and say, here are my requirements as an owner or property manager to implement these or, or for implementation of these uh, of any opportunities and so then we can actually find them. And I mentioned before, um, we're going to have to have some mechanism of verifying that the work was completed. If you implement, you, what's the change and then what is the, the benefits that are coming out of it? Um, Tune-up plan. Wow, not even using my notes. That's not a good thing. This is really just a, a quick table of contents kind of thing for a tune-up plan. Uh, we've got, you know, if you're going to take it up to management, you're trying to get somebody to buy off on it. Somebody would want to know what, what, are, what are the benefits I'm getting, what's the cost to fix it, what's the scope that I'm going to have to have. Um, you know, when you're going to implement, who authorizes it, how are you going to sign it, who's accountable, who's responsible. These are all things that, that are driven by this tune-up action plan. I think it's important uh, if you're coming in as an outside service contractor to be aware of that. I think it's also important if you're trying to drive this from the bottom up because you need to develop the sales and you continually need to sell to the financial uh, manager or fin uh, financial planner of the, of the organization. So this is where I was talking about tune-up versus retro commissioning. Um, a building tune-up. I mean, we talked earlier, it's done every two to three years, focuses on HVAC. I'm going to get back to the car analogy real quick and, and, and talk. Okay, if we do a car tune-up, um, we have, uh, we replace the plugs, we replace the plug wires, we replace the uh, fuel filter, we replace the air filter. Those are all actions we take uh, as part of a tune-up to make the system operate more efficiently. And those are very much along the lines of uh, maintenance as well. Uh, you might check the fuel pressure. That would be more in terms of an operations. On commissioning, we're really going really deep uh, into a system. So we're looking at, at system functionality when we think about that. So if we're looking at the car analogy, we're looking at uh, uh, the compression ratio in the cylinder heads or, or in the cylinders. You, we're looking at um, maybe rebuilding the carburetor. Uh, we're looking at, at much more functional pieces of the car, and it's a much more detailed piece of the car uh, than we are in, in this building tune-up piece. And so the building tune-up, again, it, I, I want to make sure there's been a lot of confusion in the market about what the building tune-up is. Uh, isn't it just retro commissioning? It is part of retro commissioning, and retro commissioning would include the entirety of building tune-up, but it is not uh, retro commissioning in and of itself. So typical opportunity areas from tune-up analysis. We've got lots of opportunity areas. Um, they're going to list four here. Uh, I have four common opportunities that I'm going to talk about in just a second that I think are the biggest opportunities in every building. And if you really want to get big savings, you can go after those. But we're going to talk here about calibrating and adjusting building controls. And that gets to um, you know, discharge air temperatures, things of that nature, lighting system operational changes. Um, you know, lamp reballast or multi-level switching or uh, maybe installing just a little motion control sensor and that could be part of the tune-up even though there's a little capital cost there. Um, equipment operation schedules, repairing equipment problems like we saw in those damper actuators for the uh, multi-zone. And so here is, here's calibrating and adjusting building controls, some, some simple examples. And the first one here is calibrate thermostats. And, one thing I want to be real clear about is calibrating thermostats is a great idea when those thermostats, thermostats are a critical control parameter. Okay? So if they're the one that's turning on the HVAC system, the package rooftop equipment, if they're the ones uh, that are you know, doing the night setback. So basically if you're looking at a five day or seven day programmable thermostat or any kind of a programmable thermostat for that matter, that becomes something that you really want to make sure has a, has a uh, reasonably good and accurate temperature. If you're looking at just a, a wall sensor, I tell you the, the, <laughs> the occupants are going to tell you when that's a problem. Uh, there's no need to do uh, a bunch of calibration on that. It's extremely costly. If there's a problem, the occupant's going to say, I'm hot. You go over and you look and you say, well, it says 70. 
but it actually is 74 in here, okay, we can make that adjustment. So we need to be careful about where we actually focus in on, in terms of when we're, we're talking about calibrating uh, thermostats. Calibrating occupancy sensors. Uh, sensitivity is really the biggest thing here, much more than the time on, time off. Make sure that they're, they are uh, not oversensitive so they're turned on because the diffuser is running, uh, or undersensitive so that they're going off every time somebody uh, uh, sits still for a while. Checking dampers controls, adjust controls to reflect occupancy patterns, those are all you know, things you can do along those lines. Uh, lighting system operational changes. Um, I know we've all been saying this for years and years and years and years and years. Group, group relamp, reballast on fixtures. Um, and it is a great opportunity and, and it is very labor saving uh, for people to do that. I've seen people starting to implement that, implement that more and more on an ongoing basis. Um, cleaning the, the reflectors and the lenses can actually increase the output of the light, which can be very beneficial as well. Uh, but during a tune-up, you know, can we measure, um, past couple days I've been doing building tune-ups and I've been measuring light levels. I want to make sure that we're getting enough light out of these fixtures and that people can see. Um, making sure that, you know, when the, we do lighting sweeps at the, the right time, we're not waiting until, you know, 11 o'clock at night before they sweep off because the sanitation or janitorial crew is coming through uh, between, you know, 8 and 10. Uh, when we're looking at outside, you know, are we using photocells so that we account for those seasonal uh, changes? I had a question. Sure. <laughs> I mean, always when we you know, start talking about lighting, I want to jump in. Um, the sensitivity on the occupancy sensors, mm -hmm. one slide further back, is that basically, uh, re you know, we've got an issue where classrooms uh, occupancy sensors are sweeping the lights off during the middle, middle of parent-teacher conferences. And it's the middle of the evening and it's winter and the, you know, so the space is dark, they've got to get up and go wave around. Um, is, there, is that more an issue, do you think, of adjusting sensitivity or adding another occupancy sensor or specking a different occupancy sensor? Well, I mean, if the, you know, part of the issue that you're talking about is really as much as anything is that that system isn't designed for one person being in the space or two people being in the space first, uh, versus 25 or 30. Um, in that particular case, yeah, overrides are, are one way of going. Uh, the sensitivity issue, if you do kick the sensitivity up, you do run the risk of having the lighting system on a lot when it doesn't need to be. Um, and it's just because of that design issue. Uh, particularly if a teacher goes into a corner, their desk is in a corner or something along those lines. If you're looking at a center um, motion sensor, those, you know, they're not going to pick up as well in the corners. So that's as much a design issue as anything. But, you know, there comes a point, where, where, do, you, where do you cross that, you know? Um, is that enough for somebody to say, well, we're just going to dump the motion sensors? Or is it enough for somebody to say, well, I'm willing to pay a little extra money and have two sensors controlling it as, as two zones? And that's certainly something to look at. Uh, thank you. One, one other question on the next slide. Looking at the group relamping, and it's related to daylight harvesting systems where maybe you've got perimeter zones with dimming ballasts and the inboard zones that aren't on dimming ballasts, and they're on all the time, but the perimeter zones on a big building are on these dimming ballasts. Does group relamping, I guess, you know, do you break it up by zones, or is it, have you run into you know, trying to do these relamping issues on buildings with aggressive daylighting and photo I control systems? I haven't looked specifically at um, splitting them up. You know, it certainly could make sense to split them up in, into two groups. And part of the reason you would look at splitting up as much as anything is if you're doing a group relamp reballast, you really want to focus on the same ballast and same lamps all the time. So you're always putting in the same thing. You're not worrying about um, two different types of, of lamps or ballasts, and that's part of the advantage of the group relamp reballast is you have the same ballast then that goes in everywhere. Um, I would think that you would lose some of the efficiency in terms of, of maintenance cost if you were to try and uh, do them both simultaneously. Um, and obviously, if they're off longer, then you would have um, the opportunity to wait longer. One of the things, though, to recognize is, and, and it's been a while since I've messed with fluorescent lamps, but uh, as you dim them, you do reduce their life. Now, granted, at the same time, you've got shorter run time, so their life is longer in terms of total days, but you know, th that differential between um, actual lamp life or, or, or real lamp life between the two may not be that different. 
<coughs> excuse me. Anybody else? I forgot to mention. I take questions during this whole thing. I, you guys will be bored to death, I guarantee, if you just sit and listen to me. Um, so if you have questions as we go through, please ask them. And thank you, Kevin, for, for bringing it up. You can count on it. Um, so adjusting equipment operations. Um, this is, you know, operating schedules, optimizing uh, your start of your equipment, maybe letting your system coast the last half hour as it, as it winds down. Um, you know, there is optimum stop on some of these systems. I'm not that thrilled with optimum stop on uh, the DDC systems, but I think the optimum starts do work very well, and I think that there's a lot of benefits to that. Uh, a lot of people worry about demand, um, and that could be an issue. I don't know if that's an issue for you guys in terms of managing uh, load in a building from a demand perspective, um, but that certainly is one of the things to consider if you look to implement an optimum start system. Optimum start is, uh, stop is great, though. It means you just shut down and, and let it coast through. Repairing equipment problems, I showed you earlier again those um, uh, damper actuators. Down here in the uh, lower right, uh, we've got a uh, coil, and you can see that thing is just filthy dirty. Uh, somebody hasn't been replacing filters on a regular basis. And that just, that severely hinders the heat transfer uh, that's, that can happen. It also can create a lot of problems if that's a, a cooling coil and you get moisture coming in there, all of a sudden you get you know, a lot of, of wetness on the uh, uh, lint and stuff that's stuck in that coil, and that can be a, a huge problem, too. So here we get to my top four savings opportunities. Um, and this is really where you'll find the cream in a building. We've got better scheduling of equipment. I mean, if you can turn something off, that's the best way to save energy. If it doesn't need to be on, shut it off. And that's number one. Uh, Comparing your occupancy schedules, the actual occupancy of a building, to your HVAC systems. Do they match? A lot of times, in fact, just recently in a building, uh, they're running 24-7. All the systems are running 24 hours a day, seven days a week. But they're really only occupied uh, from 6 a.m. to 7 p.m. And so why are they doing that? Well, we, we don't like to be cold in the morning when we show up. You know. Well, that's great, but that's a really costly thing to do. Um, so if they can schedule that equipment off, obviously they're going to get a ton of savings. Uh, critical control sensors. I mentioned earlier programmable thermostats, right? That, in, in, in an uh, office setting, is a critical control sensor. But other critical control sensors, when you're talking about some more complex systems, you've got uh, outside air temperature. So many control strategies are dependent upon what that outside air temperature is, whether you're locking out your boiler, locking out your chiller from running, uh, changing the, the temperatures that you're supplying to the different zones from an air perspective. Uh, those are all things that are, are significantly impacted by outside air. Uh, discharge air temperature. What's the temperature of the air that's coming off your cooling coil? That's a, another very critical sensor, mixed air temperature sensor. Um, if you're running your economizers and you're trying to optimize their, their operations, you want to know reasonably well what that mixed air temperature is. Uh, return air temperature, that's another one you really do want to know. A lot of people reset uh, their uh, discharge air temperatures or their supply air temperatures off coils based on those uh, return air temperatures. So that, those, are, those are really very uh, critical uh, control sensors. And you could add you know, chilled water return supply, hot water uh, supply and return. Uh, but there aren't, everything isn't in the building critical to the control of the building. And so it's, you need to go through and think about how you would set up and how you would look at each of those. And we'll talk about how you would set up an, an O&M effort around calibration of those sensors. Uh, simultaneous heating and cooling. Um, many office uh, buildings now use a variable air volume system that provides basically, mo for the most part, cold air to the space and then you reheat that air to meet the individual loads or zone needs. And if you can minimize that, you're never going to get rid of it all the way if you have a VAV system, uh, but if you can minimize that, you can save a tremendous amount of heat, or, or energy, excuse me. And you know, dual duct systems is another one that just sucks energy uh, to no end, or multi-zone systems. Anything that's, that's mixing 
the hot and cold air or anything that's, that's dumping cold air and reheating it or dumping hot air and cooling it. Uh, very, very spendy. And then the last thing is uh, unnecessary outside air. How, how are you optimizing your outside air usage? And this goes for economizer operations. Are you optimizing your economizer? Are you uh, minimizing the amount of outside air that you bring in? So are you bringing in way too much outside air? Are you bringing in too little outside air? And so those are really, in my mind, those, those are the four big hit items. It's, it's optimizing outside air. It's scheduling uh, systems and equipment on properly, whether it's lighting or HVAC. Simultaneous heating and cooling and uh, uh, critical control sensor calibration. Now here on this bottom one, uh, this is an actual uh, building. Um, this building uh, has, you know, you can see 2005 is this, this blue with the uh, diamond in it. Uh, very high usage in terms of, of kWh per square foot, 3.2 kWh per square foot. Uh, a uh, building tune-up activity was taken, uh, took place in uh, November of 05 time frame, and energy use started dropping uh, really dramatically, and they started to implement a continuous improvement activity around their operations. So their staff was getting trained, their staff started to understand some of the strategies and why they were there. They were able to participate in the tune-up. And we can see, <clears throat> excuse me, a really significant drop in energy usage then uh, by 2000. Simultaneous heating and cooling, it seems like very, uh, VAV systems are pretty popular and, and you mentioned that they automatically do that to an extent. So they, they do, and you will never avoid it entirely. So are there systems where you don't have to do that? Um, there are systems where you don't have to do that. Um, there are, are benefits. Uh, to those other types of systems. Uh, for example, variable refrigerant flow um, uh, systems that are ductless heat pumps, basically. Uh, there is uh, some value in, in using those. At the same time, you lose some of the other benefits. Um, what do you lose? Uh, uh, you typically are going to lose your economizer operations, uh, which is part of it. Um, You could, they're, they're saving, and they're savings because you can run them in a heat recovery mode. So you can actually pick up heat off of a, a perimeter zone if it's, or a core zone and, and dump it into a perimeter zone. Mm -hmm. So there are benefits to it, but there's also, um, you know, we've been going back and forth and we've kind of decided that um, for a large commercial office building, there, it would be neutral to negative for a large commercial office building. If you went to um, like condos, that there would be significant benefits. If you were looking at a little bit smaller uh, commercial office space, I think that there, it has benefits over the um, uh, VAV or the standard uh, central air systems. Uh, it's really gonna be very dependent upon each individual building as you look at it. But getting back to your question, there are systems, but the real big benefit of, of the VAV system is you have a capital cost associated with one air handler and you're driving air and meeting a bunch of different zones needs. And you can control the, um, to a certain extent, the, the discharge temperature off of your air handler so that you max or you minimize the amount of reheat that you have to actually perform uh, out at the zone level themselves. Uh, if you're looking at going the other way, you've got to figure out how you're going to meet each individual zone's needs uh, on, a, on a straight basis. And that really almost comes down to individual units serving each zone. And that's where you start to have the issue. There's a trade-off then between cost and benefit. Does that answer the question? Okay. Well, I had another question about, about reducing unnecessary outside air. And uh, I guess it depends on how you define unnecessary. But you stated one of your, one of your goals is to, uh, for occupant comfort and uh, well-being. And uh, seems like uh, more outside air can be associated with occupant comfort less than, or more than uh, less outside air? Well, occupant comfort is really going to be based on, on CO2 levels and perceived uh, freshness, which gets to the odors uh, 
and, and off-gassing that's going to occur in the space. So if you can meet those, that need of um, not having high CO2 levels and not having those, those uh, smells be in the space, then uh, you've met the minimum for outside air. And you really don't want to go any higher than that. Now, you can go, some people are going to have an extremely sensitive uh, olfactory. No, <laughs> my wife is one of them. She smells everything. But uh, you go into a building, and, and some people are never going to be happy. They're always going to smell something in the building that they think is not good. Um, but at the same time, you know, you've got to create that bell curve and say, well, what is a group of people that I want to address, and I want to be able to, I want to, be able to make most of the people in this space happy? And most of the people are going to require, you know, I'm not smelling anything. I'm not smelling the, the deli that's downstairs, and I'm not smelling the, the rubber that's in the, the um, carpet or linoleum or whatever it is. And so that's really what you're trying to achieve with, with outside air and indoor air quality. So if you meet that, that's, that's the minimum requirement. Yeah? Just again, I'll go on a little bit further with that, though. It seems like that there are a lot of discussions about more fresh air, uh, just like Steve was uh, commenting about. Um, I mean, we're even seeing some discussions on a on a uh, energy scale concerning, uh, like hospitals using 100% outside air, in some cases, in order to make sure that they really are controlling disease, et cetera. And and we're, you know, you're seeing a lot more written up about that. I guess the thing that bothers me is that. That you could have a situation where the owners and the and the building uh, designers get together and decide on a certain performance criteria and design the building that way, and then somebody else could come in and say, "Oh man, you don't have to do this," and try to change the operation of the building from that. I mean, it seems like we could do this flip flop uh, back and forth to the point where I'm not too sure how you necessarily get a handle. Well, on if that. you're running 100% outside air. Uh, in most cases, you're going to have to have some form of heat recovery occurring. Okay. Once you take that, in, that into account, um, from my perspective, if I went into a building and I saw 100% outside air with heat recovery, that's the way that's intended to operate. That's the way we're going to operate it. Uh, one of the things that's really important, and as we go through, and, and this is really more about existing buildings, but if you think about an, a new building, uh, and it becomes commissioned, one of the really important pieces that come out of that commissioning are a detailed explanation of what are the operating strategies of that building. Everybody needs to understand, and in particular the building operators need to understand, what are the operating strategies in this building? Um, recently I was in a building where the operator came in and basically told me that he was shutting down the makeup air on the systems because uh, he said it was too expensive to run makeup air into the building. Okay? Um, that's an interesting concept, a very interesting idea. Um, obviously, <laughs> it didn't make a lot of sense to me. And, but at the same time, I didn't say, turn to him and say, that's a, a stupid idea. I just said, OK, I understand. That's what you're doing. Um, that would certainly be something I wouldn't recommend. Um, you know, but he doesn't understand what is the real strategy and what is the, the operational need for that outside air. And so those are the types of things that really need to be communicated early on in a, in a building commissioning process. And then that gets to the O&M, that best practices O&M, of maintaining that over time so that when somebody else comes in and they sit down and they go, okay, well, what is this building all about? What are the operations and what are the, the plans and the strategy? Oh, okay, this is why they're doing this. We're doing 100% outside air because we have these issues and this is what we want to do. And we have the heat recovery system in place. Now that tells me that I want to make sure my heat recovery system operates as optimally as possible. Okay, I don't want a bunch of lint and dirt on my heat recovery coil so all of a sudden I got no um, heat transfer taking place. Maybe it also requires that we spend more time as designers of making sure that that information is probably written down, not just necessarily conveyed, but in some, some way is part of documentation so other people, it seems like a year from now, five out of the ten people that are going to be involved with the different processes, whether it's the maintenance people or the designers, are, are going to be gone and somebody else is going to be, you know. Uh, so, so just to pass that on by by, uh, you know, well, mouth, certainly don't want it by rote. What's that? You don't, don't want to just sit and, and discuss it with somebody. And this That's gets right. to, best pra again, best, best practices. One of the things that we really want to start seeing is we want to see an operations plan. Yeah. And that plan is 
okay, here I have an HVAC system. These are the areas it serves, and here's my VAV box zones. Not necessarily saying this is the exact VAV box, and this, but this is the zones that I've got laid out. And these are the strategies I have for each of the, the areas that I've got. These are the schedules. Right now, today, these are the schedules I have for these zones. And then making sure that that's updated. That becomes part of the as-built. And as things change, as the TI is done, that somebody goes in and updates it. You know, if, if in six months that tenant says, well, gee, now I want to run uh, 14 hours a day, that somebody goes in and says, okay, the new schedule is 14 hours a day, and this is the set points, and this is what we're going to do. That's really, really important to have because, you know, if, if the operator gets run over by a bus, if it's not written down somewhere, it's gone. Any other questions? Buildings like uh, like grocery stores that have the uh, frost-free freezers, does that use a lot of energy, or is that just kind of negligible? Do, do you know something like that? Where well, every time you go into a defrost mode, you're basically heating up. Yeah, you, you're you're yeah. You're cooling it, and you're heating and you're cooling and heating and just. But you do have to get rid of that ice, and really the only way you're going to get rid of that ice is going through a defrost mode. Now you can use a lot of different mechanisms to. Um, uh, decide how you go into that defrost mode. Uh, you can do time defrost, it's just going to occur at such and such a time and we're going to do it for so long and then we're going to be done whether it needs it or not. Um, and it's been a while since actually I've, I've done a lot of work in uh, refrigerated casework, but there's also uh, some sensors out there that can help uh, define the exact length of time for uh, the defrost cycle, which reduces the amount of energy that's required. But yeah, it uses a lot of energy. I mean, basically, you're dumping heat into the space. Now it's got to be pulled back out. Some of this grand scheme of things for the building, the entire building, is, it's, it's not necessarily just really a negligible thing. It could be quite a bit. It could be, particularly if, if somebody has gone in and made some significant changes to how um, that defrost cycle is operating. I mean, it could be very big. You know, it's, it's hard to say. If you're looking at, at large grocery stores, refrigerated casework and refrigeration is the one of the major consumers in the building. That is where energy is, is used most. Uh, and it is actually the biggest black box for a grocer. You know, I got refrigeration back there. I hope it's running. In fact, a friend of mine uh, was looking at a, uh, some refrigerated casework, and uh, on the wall he showed me a picture. It said, please do not push this button it shuts off all the refrigeration in the building. And there's just this little red button sitting in the wall. I mean, that's all it was, was a red button. Nobody knew what it was, and yet obviously somebody would go by and go, what's that? <laughs> so, um, hopefully I can get through this. So we're gonna go move from tune-up to O&M. So, a tune-up, we're talking periodic. Um, we're looking at, you know, every 3,000 miles, we're going to change the oil, rotate the tires. Uh, and then for standard O&M, you know, we're looking at an ongoing activity, an ongoing practice. And, you know, again, we want to get from this standard operations to a more uh, uh, proactive and uh, strategic, I guess is the best way of putting it, uh, operating practices. So when we look at what is enhanced O&M, uh, one of the things I like to say, it's, it's the operations, okay? Everybody does maintenance. And some people don't do it very well, but everybody does maintenance. A lot of times you don't have people that actually operate the building. There's nobody there that really knows what's going on in the building. Uh, hey, it, I'm comfortable. That's really all that matters, right? Um, so when you look at the standard M, the standard maintenance, fill the tank, wash the windows, check the water and oil levels, you know, when you think about it from an operations perspective, what do you think about? You've got fill the tank and check the miles per gallon. Okay, so now that's from an operator's perspective. I want to check the MPG. Uh, inflate the tires, uh, accelerate gradually. Uh, coast versus brake to stoplights. You know, these are all things in, in keeping with that car analogy about what you can do as an operator to be more energy efficient. So what we want to make sure we do is, is give these operators the skills and the expertise to be able to, to deliver that on an ongoing basis. Um, so actually, I'm not going to do the exercise. We're running kind of short. Uh, this is kind of an interesting slide. Some of you may have seen it, and actually, I am going to I'm going to use the pointer this time instead of the mouse because the mouse covers too much. 
Um, what this is, is this is a, a study that was done in 2007 um, through NPI for lead buildings. And it's a comparison of energy savings predicted versus achieved. And these are lead buildings. So you've got lead level, you know, certified silver, gold, platinum. Um, and so down on this part, you have what was the proposed savings percentage as a total number versus the energy code. Uh, up here, you've got the actual savings. And then down here, you have savings that are minus. And basically, you're using more than the code building projected. So this line becomes, you know, if we said we're going to save 20%, we save 20%. All right, we're right at expected. And so what we see is 40% of these lead buildings aren't achieving the energy savings that was expected. And why? You know, we can talk about a lot of different reasons why. Um, one of the big reasons, I think, is modeling. We're looking at a new building. So, I, you know, in, in a new building, the modeler really doesn't have a whole lot to go on in terms of being able to tune the building to the exact way it's going to be operated. Uh, but one of the big issues in here is, is operations. We're not getting what you were talking about earlier, that transition from uh, a new building into the operations piece. You're not creating uh, uh, operating staff that really understand the strategies in the building. What are my operating strategies? Why has this system been installed this way? And in particular, with these lead buildings, we have very complex strategies and very complex systems, um, and it makes it really difficult for them to go uh, move forward. And you can see, I mean, there's, there's a bunch of buildings down. I guess I can use the mouse for this. There's a bunch of buildings down here that are, are using more energy than the code building, or what was predicted for the code building. So let's be careful about that. We don't want to push it too far. So one way that we think we can address this is for ongoing practices. So we have really six key things for an enhanced O&M program, and that's what we're going to talk about. We talked about building tune-up before. We're going to talk about an enhanced O&M program. And, and the first thing we need to do really is perform our maintenance. You've got to do your PMs. Uh, maintenance is really about uh, equipment reliability, but it's also about capacity. It's making sure that my 100-ton chiller can put out 100 tons, uh, and that's part of what that maintenance piece is about. And it's, it's about whether, can I get it? You know, when I turn it on, is it actually still there? But we also need to track and report our building energy use so that we can um, see if there are anomalies that are occurring. We need to, to have better documentation. We talked about the uh, operational strategies, but we can also talk about as-builts. How many people actually have good as-builts five years after a building is completed, after they've done a bunch of TIs, after they've done these other things, after they've changed the sequences? You know, there were original sequences there, and somebody's messed with them. We know that almost every time. And those, uh, those changes usually aren't documented. Um, what kind of performance indicators can we monitor? And I've got a really very specific example of, of some performance indicators. And then, you know, from this continuous improvement perspective, how do we review these things on an ongoing basis? You know, we need to make sure that what we're doing today is still good tomorrow, and that talks you know, to occupancy schedules. You know, as they change, we need to change those occupancy schedules in the building. And then lastly is, is uh, develop building operator staff expertise or service contractor expertise. I mean, again, a lot of service contractors are delivering operations, not just maintenance, but they're delivering operations into these buildings. And we're calling it O&M and really thinking of it only as filter changes and, and belt changes and things of that nature, but they're actually operating uh, these buildings. Um, ongoing building maintenance, you know, we need to have an inventory of equipment, we need to perform our PMs, all those things. Uh, there's checklists that we can do. This isn't actually a filter down here in this corner. Uh, this is just an outside air intake, just, it's, 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 it's a lint-free uh, outside air intake. Uh, but those need to be cleaned, I mean, those are things that need to be done, and that's part of, of PMs that need to be done. Tracking energy use. Um, this actually is Portfolio Manager. It is a uh, EPA DOE sponsored uh, website where people can go in, put information about their building, uh, particularly energy usage, uh, both gas and electric. It'll actually do water as well. Uh, and it'll normalize it, weather normalize the data so that you can start to compare yourself across the country. Um, it has, uh, uses some of the CBEX data that, that uh, uh, is put together through a survey. Um, but it, what it helps to do is it establishes a baseline performance for your building. And this is really a first step in being able to uh, 
track and, and report energy usage. So the next thing is, how do you report that? And reporting energy usage, you know, there's somebody that's going to be uh, assigned the responsibility and accountability of tracking that. But somebody else has got to know who, who within the chain uh, up needs to know that information and how are you going to present that and who below in that chain needs to understand what's going on. Uh, one of my favorite examples of, uh, of knowledge and, or lack of knowledge in terms of energy costs and energy benefits, I was looking at a uh, steam coil on a hospital and um, I noticed that there was a five degree delta T across the coil uh, on the plus side. And I was like, well, what's going on there? And so I'm, I'm looking at it and sure enough, there's, there's a five degree delta T and they had a, the valve was fully closed and they're getting a uh, bypass through that steam valve. So I called up, I was working with a service contractor at the time, I called them up and said, hey, you know, we, we need to deal with this. This is one of the values that we can provide the customer. And so he says, oh yeah, you're absolutely right. And so he calls around trying to find somebody to go out and take a look at it and figure out you know, exactly what the problem was. He calls me back in two days and says, well, you know, actually, my guy went out and fixed that a couple days ago. Um, and he said, you know, fortunately you mentioned it because he wasn't going to tell anybody. And, and it was a $10,000 fix. And he wasn't going to communicate that. And so one of the really important things is, is people have to communicate the value that they're providing uh, within their organization, outside their organization, if they're working as a, as a service provider or a service contractor to people. Otherwise, no one else is going to do it for us. Uh, review and improve system documentation. So here it's, it's really about as built. It's making sure everything's current. Um, do we have good control sequences? Do we really understand the operating strategies? Uh, you know, O&M manuals. How many times have I gone into a building and I've seen O&M manuals from 1954 of equipment that's gone? You know, what's it even doing there? Get rid of it. Um, you know, you're talking about usefulness of the, of the materials that are there, the accessibility of the materials. There's lots of things that, you know, people need to go through these things on an ongoing basis and making sure that that stuff is gone. Or even um, uh, testing some of the test and balance reports. You know, how far back do you want to keep it? Um, you know, you can really create this huge library that's unaccessible and nobody can use uh, if, if you aren't really careful. And of course, you know, how often are as-built? I mentioned that so many times. I, I get so frustrated about as-built uh, drawings. So here's a, a, a question, you know, do the as-built show where the sensors are located? Um, do we have duct static sensor locations? Do we have floor static, uh, you know, temperature sensors? Uh, some of these things, temperature sensors, I don't think are as critical, but duct static, I think that's a critical one. Where is it? You know, I need to be able to find that, that, that thing. Where's the floor static? You know, that's a critical sensor. Um, fan system temperatures, discharge air, return air, all those things. It's, it's important. Whoop. So the next activity here is key performance indicators. And, and this is a little different than um, tracking and reporting energy usage. This is about trending. This is about comparing myself today from yesterday. And so we're looking at, at two, two different pieces here. We have whole building KPIs, key performance indicators, performance indicators, whatever you want to call them. And we have systems key performance indicators. And so within a building, you've got you know, energy consumption KBTU per square foot. Um, you've got the energy cost per square foot, tenant complaints. That's a, that's a great KPI to track. Um, maintenance dollars. Uh, per square foot as one to track. And the reason we like to put it into per square foot is now we can start to compare across. We can compare building A to c building B. One of the things we have to be really careful about though is um, weather normalization is a critical factor uh, in doing really good comparisons. So it's really difficult to compare a straight KBTU per square foot from a building in Boise to a straight KBTU per square foot for a building in uh, Portland or Seattle. Um, and you can, you can look at this chart here and you can see, you know, if I start comparing even month to month, uh, I really can't even do that. I have to compare same month to same month. And so some of the things that we can do is we can look at cooling degree days. So if we can say, well, what was the energy usage for January and what were the cooling degree days for January? And you can start to make that comparison then uh, on an ongoing basis for KBTU per square foot cooling degree or KBTU per square foot heating degree. And that's kind of a way of, of creating some of that normalization. But this can also be very useful if you see certain spikes. Um, if something really jumps up, uh, it's, it's certainly a way of, of identifying it. But even more useful 
are the uh, key performance indicators around systems. And, and this is a, a system KPI for a chiller. In this particular case, it's a trend. And I'm, I'm going to use it as an example. Uh, I'm going to have to flip through what we're saying uh, should be done. But here is, this is a key performance indicator. And so recognize that we don't have to look at just a specific number. We can look at other things. And this is actually pretty complicated. And for the poor people on the video, they aren't going to see this uh, from the laser pointer. But what we're looking at is this chiller is operating during cold temperatures. So we've got a 35 degree outside air temperature. So this is outside air, this green line. We have the chiller running. So the 100% line or 100 there is, is for the chiller running. And then we've got a discharge air temperature and a mixed air temperature. Why our chiller is running at 35, you know, 45, 50 degrees is, is I mean, there's no reason for the, to do that, particularly when you can use outside air to cool your space. And so in this, this case, we're looking at it, we're saying, well, the mixed air temperature is way too high. It should be the same as this discharge air temperature. That's an abnormal operation. We don't like that operation. So we went through and we looked at fixing it. Okay? And what we actually ended up fixing was just the mixed air dampers. All we had to do was go in and, and replace a, a damper actuator. And all of a sudden, this chiller starts operating right. So this is the way the chiller should look. So if you're looking at this on a daily basis, or even uh, potentially uh, for, from yesterday, you'll immediately see things that jump out at you Why the chiller was running all night long. But here is a normal. You can see it's chiller's off down here. We have the mixed air temperature and the supply air temperature at about the same until outside air gets high, so the economizer's working right. Okay, And then, you know, the, the, the outside air climbs, the chiller comes on, it meets the load, and then it shuts down. You can also see these outside air dampers, whoops, in this particular case, are flat. We got 20% outside air. And here, they're actually starting to modulate. In this particular case, we were looking at, I think it was a, a 140,000 square foot office building in Seattle. Uh, there were no comfort complaints. So the occupants were happy as clams. I mean, we had plenty of, of um, cooling. Uh, the space was 72 degrees. Everybody was happy. So there's, there's no reason to be worried about the building from many people's perspective. But when you go in and you look, we're looking at, um, 480,000 kilowatt hours a year saved, which at your rates, about four and a half cents, we're talking about $21,000. You know, so there's, there is significant value in, in some of these activities. Um, and they, they can be hard to discover, but they aren't necessarily hard to discover. And again, it comes back to an operator. Now, from a building tune-up perspective, if you go in through a building, you know, you're going to catch these kinds of things. These are the kind of big hit items you love to catch. You know, it's running when it shouldn't be running. The economizer, the outside air. This is the first thing that, that would, you would look at when you're optimizing your outside air. Why isn't, in this particular case, the economizer is running right? But in this particular case, you know, the first question I would ask is, well, why, aren't you, why isn't your economizer working? Jim, I have a quick question from a non-mechanical engineer on that previous chart. There, it looks like there's an hour lag before your mixed air dampers close back down to 20% after your chillers are on full. I don't understand why. Do you know why? Well, that's because the return air, see here, your return air? Okay. Um, as long as the outside air is below the return air temperature, then you want to use 100% outside air. As soon as the outside air gets warmer than the return air, you're better off using the return air. So that there's just a choice made uh, right at that point. Also, that's just showing the chiller is being either on or off. It doesn't really tell it us. It doesn't show us part load or anything like that nature. And, which, and which I'm glad you mentioned because if you go back to this, the other thing they were having a lot of problems with is they were having maintenance issues with this chiller. Um, they were running this chiller really, really low part loads, really low. Um, and chillers don't like it. And they basically probably took, you know, five to ten years of life off their chiller during this time period, which is a lot of money too. You know, and they aren't really going to know how much they took off until it dies. I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, regular review of O&M activities and routines. Um, we talked about equipment operating sequences. They're changing all the time. Tenants are changing. What are the schedules? What are my set points? 
Um, you know, this particular, <laughs> I will mention this, this is a, uh, uh, went up on a roof and it, this actually wasn't me, this was somebody else and, and the service contractor had been there a few days before changing filters and that's where they left them. Um, this service contractor wasn't doing a particularly outstanding job. The one you can see there's, you know, a lot of bird screen on that uh, intake and return and exhaust and <laughs> they, they actually had some issues uh, not, not, not participating for very long, much longer in that building. Um, so, th and this gets to this, this point here, service contractor, vendor, uh, uh, support review. We really need to make sure that from a service contractor perspective, uh, we are tracking their work in, in the buildings. So is there a QAQC role? I mean, granted, there is a huge amount of trust that you've got to have with your vendors um, as, as they're providing services in buildings. But you also got to step back and say, you know, I need to have some, some level of QAQC because people do have a tendency, you know, one person may be great, another person may be not so good at this particular building. And you need to start tracking that and making sure that that's really what's occurring. If they say they're going to be there and do such and such, let's make sure that they do those things. Uh, they need to be held accountable. But they are part of the team. Um, Better Bricks has a lot of, of uh, um, support from a documentation perspective and things of that nature that, that's accessible through the Better Bricks website. And, and right at the last slide, I'll show you what that is. Um, but you know, one of the things that, that, that really needs to happen is you have to be an informed consumer. Uh, and it makes it hard because being an informed consumer, if you only have you know, uh, one building that you're managing or that uh, you're working in, you don't necessarily really uh, have the time or the expertise to be an informed consumer. So we've got some, some things uh, that for scopes of work enhanced uh, uh, service packages we, that we have defined. So they're particularly for packaged rooftop equipment. It's a little harder for us from a uh, complex system. But if there is packaged rooftop equipment, we have a, uh, almost a checklist of things that should be done in the building from a best practices perspective. Um, I'm actually working on getting that up online here pretty soon. Uh, if, if, uh, you guys are, if anybody's interested in seeing what that checklist is, you know, just come up to me afterwards and, and give me your card and I will try and, and forward the, the document to you. So that's one way that you can do it is here's my scope. This is what I want done and I want validation and verification uh, of how it was done. Um, a lot of the service providers uh, in, the, in the area, you know, one of the things we have to be really careful of is making sure that if you've got one and you're asking them to do a building tune-up, they really know how to do a building tune-up. They really know how to operate a building. They really know how to identify and diagnose uh, HVAC and, and controls problems and service problems. Um, you know, sometimes the best option is to go to an engineer. Uh, but again, your service contractor uh, is, is, does need to be a part of that team. Um, <laughs> I know the larger buildings here in Boise are going to have building engineers inside, but a lot of the smaller ones, you know, the 50, 70,000 square foot buildings are just solely served by service contractors. Uh, here's an example of an, of an enhanced service package. It actually is much more complex now. Complex probably isn't the right word. It's much more uh, checklist oriented, and I think it does a much better job of detailing what it out is. Uh, we talk about adding an economizer. You need to be really cautious and careful that the economizer is cost effective. Um, they can be very spendy and they may not save a lot of energy for you, but that certainly is an option. Uh, your vendors should be looking at um, uh, doing refrigerant checks occasionally. Uh, there's some tools now out there that they can actually do some of that stuff online. They can check suction pressures, uh, they can check discharge pressures, um, and uh, do some actual uh, diagnostic activities using this tool uh, to de define how well uh, packaged equipment is operating. They need to be calibrating, making sure the economizer is operating right, making sure the settings are appropriate for the area, uh, recalibrating thermostat schedules, uh, all those different things. Uh, staff expertise, we've talked a little bit about that, but you know, every building is a little bit different and you really need to make sure that your staff, assuming you have one out there in the market, uh, is able to operate those systems. Um, you know, if they're operating a boiler, do they really understand how that boiler is operating in the sequence and, and what its needs are and what the system's needs are. 
Uh, there are some training. There's a building operator certification program out there for building operators. We're beginning to work with um, some uh, unions in supporting some of the training activities for uh, the trades, uh, trying to provide some energy awareness as well as um, uh, a better understanding of, of systems operations for some of them. Uh, some of the pitfalls, uh, you know, one of the big things you see is, is uh, building engineers react. Uh, it's about, you know, the problem that we're seeing now. And, and if we can establish these best practices for O&M activities, uh, it, it starts to free them up so they're be better able to react to some of those. And, and they can also then start to be a little more proactive in uh, the activities that they're doing. Um, I don't know, I'm just going to ask questions. I don't think there's anybody here from uh, building operations. Here's so seven enhanced operational opportunities. You know, this is really defined for the, the, the building engineer. We've got you know, some of the innovations in real estate that are actually occurring now. Um, not always, but day cleaning, that's an interesting one. I hadn't really heard of that, about that one until recently where you actually, janitorial staff comes in during the day and cleans. So they're not in the building at night. The building can be completely shut down. Uh, security guards going through and making sure that lighting's turned off. Um, uh, uh, tenant office equipment, so we're looking at like Energy Star equipment, also looking at automatic shutdown. You know, there's some uh, controls now that can be done through the uh, servers that will automatically shut the computers down. And then telecommuting, this gets back to the uh, age old things are better turned off than they are uh, uh, on. Of course, if you're telecommuting, that does just shift the load somewhere else. <laughs> it, it helps you in your building, but it doesn't help uh, the, necessarily the uh, entire uh, uh, demand. I think that's about it. Here's some resources. Betterbricks.com has a bunch of stuff for building operations. They've got a bunch of stuff for a lot of things. So if anybody's interested in looking at betterbricks.com, uh, the BOMA Beep series, that's a great one for... Um, uh, facility managers and property managers. Um, there might be some value in, in some of the uh, architects and engineers taking a look at it. I talked briefly about um, uh, building operator certification and you know as I look at this I should have removed all that shouldn't I? Bummer. That's a big faux pas. Pie in my face. Um, Idaho Power, they're here. I'm going to stand right here. <laughs> and, you, and you can talk with Idaho Power right here and now. You don't even have to see their uh, website. So. That's pretty much it. Does anybody have any other questions? I'm glad we got more questions going there towards the end. It was, I was starting to get a little bored myself. Yeah. You talk about commissioning and doing the tune-up correctly. Mm -hmm. And I don't think you're from here, but do you have people that you can recommend? Um, or and even if you don't recommend it, but anyone in the area that does it? I am aware right now of um, two contractors or two engineering firms that do it. Um, one is Musgrove. And I don't, I don't know. If they are doing tune-ups and commissioning, okay. uh, and there is one other one, and I can't think of the name right off the top of my head. CTA. CTA. Are you guys with CTA? We have a commissioning group. So you guys are doing work actually in Kalispell. We are. We have a, a big project that we are working on for uh, the hospital. For the right? hospital, regional hospital yeah, that, there. That I've kind of been involved in from the periphery. Yeah, and our, the, the group that does it is out of, uh, is out of Montana, but uh, we get them over here quite a bit because we've got a lot of work here. So we're, we uh, essentially, uh, on most of our projects, try to get commissioning as part of our project and uh, have those guys do it there semi-independent. It works out a lot better than not having any commissioning at all. And uh, they definitely hold our feet to the fire if we do something wrong. So it's, it's, a, it's a good deal. There's a lot of issues right now with commissioning, and I didn't really talk about that. Um, commissioning, and, and I think LEED has, has been a part of this, unfortunately, is, is it's turned into a checklist. Um, it's not about 
you know, optimizing systems. It's not about, um, uh, you know, taking and making the energy efficiency uh, operate the best. A lot of times now people are starting to get into this habit of it's just a checklist. Does the fan spin the right way? Yep. You know, um, is the valve fully functioning, open and closed? Yep. You know, and, and that's one thing we need to get back to doing a, a, a more uh, uh, detailed job uh, in, in the commissioning arena. And retro commissioning is, is more along uh, those lines, just because it becomes that you're not looking at a, at, a, at a new construction project, you're actually looking at trying to optimize. That's kind of the whole goal of retro commissioning, which, you know, building tune-up is a part of that as well. I'm not sure I understand your comment about lead and how it affected commissioning, because I think lead is actually brought attention to commissioning and encouraged people to get commissioning because you have to do basic commissioning in order to get a building certified. I, I, I agree totally with that comment. I do. I think though what has happened is um, it's, it's become much about as much for the commissioning agents about just going through the checklist. It's just a form that they have to, they want to fill out. And I'm not saying, I, I think that LEED as having forms has created um, a tendency for commissioning agents to drive to that uh, way of commissioning buildings. And I'm not saying that they're doing the functional testing. I'm not saying that. I'm saying they're not optimizing the buildings. They're not looking at how do I make this building um, more energy efficient. Uh, they're not looking at changing the sequences of operations. They're looking at the design intent and they're saying, does this meet the design intent? And it doesn't matter if the design intent is good or bad, it's does it meet the design intent? Um, I could probably put them somewhere. Let me uh, let me talk with Ken afterwards. We can, put them, we can probably put them uh, on the, the, lab, the lab's website. Yeah, we'll go ahead. There'll, there'll be a, a video stream very shortly. I've promised this for you guys before, I know, but Tristan's been working on the new website all summer, and I promise you we're close. Uh, we really thought we might get it done for today. We didn't quite get there. Um, so the video stream will be available, and I'll work with you, Jim, to see if we can okay. get your, a PDF of your show if you're able to do okay. that. Yeah. Maybe, maybe with the right And I will this. actually get rid of the local utility <laughs> thing before it goes up on the website. <laughs> Were there any other questions from the audience? Well, um, let's thank Jim for coming over. <laughs> Appreciate you making the trip out. Are you coming back to Idaho anytime in the near future? Uh, I probably will be for some of the work that I've been doing over the past few days. Okay, so he might be back in town from time to time if you want to follow up and catch him for lunch or something. Um, I wanted to make one note about the October 13th uh, series. So it's not the next one, but the, or, or session. It's not the next one, but the one after. It's the only one that's not on a Thursday night. It's on a Monday night. We had a professor coming from Georgia, and his teaching schedule wouldn't allow coming in on a Thursday. So otherwise, they'll all be on Thursday night. So the very next section uh, session is October 9th on hospitals, and then the following Monday, just a few days later, on the building information modeling. So with that, thanks again to Idaho Power, uh, Northwestern Energy, and Better Bricks. Thanks, Jim.